Good morning. So mostly we're going to introduce some stuff from linear algebra today. Some of our students may have already seen some or most of this before, but we'll start with a matrix. And a matrix is a rectangular array of numbers. So like one, two, negative three, one fifth, arranged in a square, or one, zero, two, six, four, negative one, arranged in a rectangle. Um, matrices are surrounded by either open parentheses or closed brackets. Unlike most situations in math, where, you know, interval notation, for example, there's no difference whether you use open parentheses or closed brackets. It's just a matter of personal preference. Um, I use both in this class. So a matrix has rows and columns. When we want to talk about how big a matrix is, um, we always talk about the number of rows, then we put a cross, a time symbol, except we're not doing multiplication, the number of columns. So there, there are two rows and two columns. Here, it will probably be clearer because those numbers are different, two rows and three columns. A matrix with only one row or one column is called a vector. Although vectors are just special, technically speaking, special kinds of matrices, we tend to do a different thing as with vectors than we do with other matrices. So it's probably better to think of them as being their own type of thing. Uh, sort of sit related to that, vectors or matrices, I should say, don't have any special notation associated with them. I mean, I guess they're most commonly written using capital letters from the beginning of the alphabet, A, B, and C. But vectors, by contrast, have special notation. They're written as either a lowercase letter with a barbed little dash over them, or some people might just write this as a full arrow, or sometimes you see just a straight line segment. So the exact note, uh, convention varies from book to book. But if you see anything that looks like this, it's a vector. I say varies from book to book, actually, 
in textbooks. Textbooks have their own convention. They usually use bold font for vectors. So instead of a V with a dash above it, you'd see a, a bold So operating with matrices and with vectors, in general, is more complicated than operating with real numbers. Um, we can only sometimes multiply vectors um, matrices together. We don't really have matrix division, although we sort of do. That's all linear algebra stuff, mass 337. In this class, we need to know that we can add and subtract vectors. And one other thing, and that will be enough for us. Addition is done what we call component-wise, which means that when you're adding vectors together, You look at what number, the numbers that are across from each other, and you add those. One and negative one, two and four, four and two, to give, in this case, zero, six, six. You can only add and subtract vectors that are of the same size. So for example, something like this is not allowed because the vectors are not of the same size. One is three by one, one is two by one. Um, I put subtraction, or rather I put addition on the board. Subtraction is also done component-wise. One, two, seven, minus zero, negative three, six. One minus zero, two minus negative three, just putting two minus signs next to each other is not great notation, but that minus a negative is going to turn into addition. Seven minus six is positive one. Another thing we can do with vectors is what's called scalar multiplication. We don't really have multiplication as we understand it for vectors. We do not take two vectors and multiply them together. I mean, there are 
you might be familiar with the dot product, the cross product. Those are kind of special things. Um, what we do do is take vectors and multiply them by numbers. For example, we can take the number four and multiply it by the vector one, two, seven. And to do that multiplication, we just take that four, we multiply it by one, we multiply it by two, we multiply it by seven. So four, eight, 28. It's going to be useful in this class to have some understanding of vectors sort of on a graphical level. Now, in the real world, we can't usually graph vectors. Um, in particular, if a vector has too many components, too many entries, we're not going to be able to graph it. In the kind of special case, where a vector has just two entries, A and B, we can think of that graphically. And the reason we can think of this graphically is that a vector of two entries is basically an ordered list of numbers. It's an A followed by a B. And we already have a way of graphing an ordered list of numbers, an A followed by a B. And that is the Cartesian plane. So we can graph the point A comma B to graph the vector A B, we draw an arrow connecting the origin to the point. This arrow is getting at the idea that a vector has a direction. Like this vector A comma B is pointing off somewhere. That's an idea that's going to be helpful to us down the line. But for now, we really just wanted to mention it. Um, one other thing related to this that we should probably mention or talk about is maybe a better phrase than mention So what we saw on this frame was that this vector has a direction. It's pointing off up and to the right. Well, this vector also has a length. I mean, it's a line segment, essentially. And what doing um, and scalar multiplication is called scalar multiplication because it scales that line segment 
if we have a vector v, that looks like this, and has this length, then if we want to talk about two times v, let me see if I can do this. And I, yeah, I know I'm standing right in front of the whiteboard. I'll move in a moment. If we want to talk about two times V, it's in the same direction as V. V and two V are both pointing up and to the right. But two of E is twice as long as V. That length doubles. And if we then wanted to have three V, that length would triple, and so on. So here's something new. I mean, assuming that you haven't taken a differential equations course before, it's certainly not something we talk about in linear algebra. That being said, the idea is not, I hope, going to be super complicated. Um, in linear algebra, we look at matrices and vectors that have numbers in them. We look very briefly at what happens if those numbers are complex or imaginary, but that's as far as we go. In differential equations, we're going to be looking at matrices and vectors that have functions in them. So we might have a vector that looks like this. And just that you can take the derivative of a function, you can take the derivative of a vector of functions, and it's done component-wise. So up here, we use the chain rule, take the derivative down here. We also use the chain rule, take the derivative. And so on. Um, Actually, taking derivatives, we're not going to be doing a lot of in this class. That being said, no, I mean, if, if you're in a differential equations class, you should certainly be able to differentiate e to the t, and you should be able to use the chain rule to take the derivatives that we see here. Um, again, if you think of calculus, some of the rules we learn in calculus continue to apply 
So for example, in the calculus, we learned that the derivative of a sum is the sum of the derivatives. This is true for vectors as well. We're not absolutely convinced we're ever going to use this fact. But since it's in the textbook, I figured I'd better put it on the whiteboard. And in the calculus, if you have a scalar and you want to take the derivative, the scalar just sits there. And that continues to be true for differential equations. We are not going to need a vector product rule or a vector quotient rule. So good news, the two most the two more complicated rules from calculus we do not need in this course. Moving on back to linear algebra. I mean, some of you in the uh, in the math department's advising template that says we're taking this class before linear algebra, which is why we have to do all of this. I know that's not true for every student, but um. Moving back to stuff that may be familiar to some students because it gets taught in linear algebra. We can multiply a matrix by a vector, but only sometimes. To multiply a matrix by a vector, the dimensions have to match. So if this matrix A has M rows and N columns, we can multiply it by a vector that has N rows and one column. When I say the dimensions have to match, those inner numbers have to be the same. The result of this multiplication is a vector. And the outer dimensions give the size of the vector. As a slight aside, um, you may notice that when I define vectors, I said they have one row or one column, but then in everything I've been doing with vectors, I've been looking at vectors that have a single column. And that's going to continue to be the case throughout the class. You can have a vector with a single row, but there's a strong convention that we use vectors with a single column. And you're seeing that here. This V has many rows, but one column. This W has many rows, but one column. How does this multiplication work? Um, again, this is, this is a sort of weird thing where we're going to keep writing matrix vector products 
but the details of how that multiplication actually works are mostly not going to be very important to us. Still, if we're going to keep writing them down, we ought to have some idea of what these things are, typo. This might not be, if you've seen this before, this might not be quite how you saw it, but we're going to define this product to be the weighted combination of the columns of the matrix. And what on earth does that mean? Well, this matrix has three columns. One, four, two, two, three, zero. First, to spend a lot of time on stuff that probably doesn't actually matter. So this matrix has three columns, which I've just circled. This vector has three entries. And the way that we define a matrix times a vector is we take the first column here and we scale or multiply it by the first entry here. And then we take the second column and we scale or multiply it by the second entry of the vector. And then we take the third column and we scale or multiply it by the third entry. And then we add all of those up or subtract in the case of that last thing where there's a negative sign. It's slightly tedious, but as I said, in this class, even though we're going to constantly be working with matrices times vectors, we're actually going to be doing this operation quite rarely. Um, anyway, 14 plus one is 15, minus six is nine, four and 14 is 18, Minus zero is still 18. This definition of a matrix times a vector cannot be called intuitive. Like if you gathered a hundred students who had never seen this before, and you asked them to define what they thought a matrix times a vector should be. I'm not certain what they'd come up with, but I doubt most of them would come up with this. We're going to see, though, 
why this particular definition is so useful. And in spite of its oddity, this definition satisfies a major property that we like for multiplication to have, which is that it distributes over addition. So I don't know if it's natural, but it does have at least one very nice property. Another property, this is something we'll talk about more in linear algebra. Um, basically, when you do multiplication and you've got matrices and you've got vectors, order matters. So you can't Zip stuff around. You can't rearrange your terms. A times U is not the same as U times A. What the second property is telling you is, well, you can't move most stuff around. But you can move scalars around. If you have a scalar there in front of the vector, you can move it to be in front of the matrix. Questions so far? What linear algebra gives us is multiple ways of talking about the same equation. But linear algebra struggles a bit, I think, to explain why we would want to use one way over another. Well, differential equations is going to give us a bit of an answer to that. Thanks to linear algebra, we have three ways of writing the same equation. When I say equation, I really mean system of equations. What we um, talked about in terms of differential equations on Tuesday, we also have in linear algebra. In linear algebra, well, this isn't quite what you get, but what you get more or less is something equals a scalar times a variable plus another scalar times another variable plus another scalar times another variable. However many variables you want to have. I mean, there are that real world um, equations like this, where you have billions of variables. And then the next equation looks basically the same. It's a number times the first variable plus a number times the second variable, plus a number, times the third variable, plus a number, 
times the nth variable. And in linear algebra, we don't insist on this, but in all of the applications we're going to look at in this class, we are going to have as many equations as we have variables. So you see the variables are counting up, one, two, three, up to n. So we'll assume that we also have n equations. And this is a system of linear equations. Um, in linear algebra, instead of y1, y2, up to yn, you would have numbers, but this is fairly very similar to what we do in linear algebra. This is the same as a vector equation. This is the same as saying that the vector y1, y2, up to yn is x sub 1. times the vector of these numbers plus x sub 2 times the vector of these numbers and so on, until we get the x sub n times the vector of these numbers. That nothing like what it was supposed to look like. So, a system of linear equations can be rewritten as a vector equation. This is also the same as saying that the vector y1, y2, up to yn equals a matrix times the vector x1, x2, up to xn. I say a matrix what matrix? Well, the matrix that's going to store all of these numbers, all of these coefficients. So its first row will have the a sub one, one, and the a sub one, two, all the way up to the a sub one, n, the second row will have the a sub 2, 1, and the a sub 2, 2, all the way up to the a sub 2, n, and so on, until the last row, which will have the a sub n, 1, 
and the A sub N2, and so on, until we get to the A sub N N. And in differential equations, I mean, when we work with linear systems, we mostly write them in that third way. Yeah. And if nothing else, we mostly write them in the third way because the third way is super compact. I mean, that thing we have on top that's taking up an entire half of the screen, there's really no way we could write that using fewer letters or fewer pen strokes than we already did. Here, we could say, well, a vector y is x1 times some vector plus x2 times some vector and so on up to xn times some vector. So that's fewer pen strokes. But here we can just say, well, a vector equals some matrix times some other vector. So if for no other reason than that we don't want writing down every problem to take, you know, half of the class period, we are really going to heavily utilize this third method of writing equations. It's very compact. What sort of equations are we looking at in differential equations? Everything on this frame, I could be teaching a linear algebra class. Presumably, in differential equations, we're going to want some derivative somewhere. So we talked about systems on a uh, Tuesday. So at least for the moment, we're going to be looking at systems of a very specific sort, systems of linear differential equations. So in this system, these p's, I'm not using function notation for them, but they could be functions of the variable t. Uh, in the examples we actually look at, they won't be, but I'll at least present this material in generality. So that's x1 prime, then this is x2 prime, And so on. It's tedious to write, as I mentioned in the last frame. But if you take a system like this and you write it using this notation, suddenly it's not tedious to write at all. We've got the derivatives of x, we've got a list of those. So a derivative of a vector 
equals summer matrix, the matrix of the years P years times a vector X and this X is X1, X2, up to Xn, plus another vector. The vector of these Fs. So writing a system of equations like this as compact as possible. This is what we're trying to solve. In the situations we're primarily going to be looking at, this vector won't be there. All of the f's will be a zero, which to reuse a word we have already used before means that we call this system of equations homogeneous. So in general, at least for the next few sections or chapters, We're going to be looking at equations that look like this, except again, in reality, in the, um, in the sort of applications we're interested in, none of these P's are going to be functions. These P's will just be constants. So we're interested in systems of equations that can be written like this. And by the end of this class, we're going to be kind of an expert at these things. By the end of this class, we'll be able to solve any differential equation that looks like this. Um, so we have definitions and results that pass through to this new context, basically without modification. Like we defined linear independence. And when we defined linear independence, it was in terms of a bunch of functions. Well, now we still have functions, but we have vectors of functions. So a vector of functions, a second vector of functions, and so on, an nth vector of functions. And our definition of linear independence passes through without modification. If C1 times X1 plus C2 times X2, plus up to Cn 
times xn equals zero is identically equal to zero. That means that all of these c's are zero. If there's any way for this to happen where the c's are not zero, then we call these functions, these vectors of functions, dependent. So yes, exactly the definition we had for normal functions, it still works now that we have vectors of functions. We said that an equation written like this is called homogeneous. Be, um, and again, the reason it's called homogeneous so much nonsense probably distracting everyone. The reason it's called homogeneous is that we don't have any of those Fs. We have all of these Fs are zero, so we don't have that term. Well, when we were working with individual linear differential equations, if we if the linear differential equation was homogeneous, we could use the superposition principle. That continues to be the case now. The superposition principle. So you've got x prime equals px. And say we have solutions. So say that p is an n by n matrix. And x is an n by one vector. Then just like in the non-system case, we want to find a bunch of solutions and turn them into a general solution. Here, when I say a bunch of solutions, I mean n. Again, it's possible to do differential equations in all sorts of contexts, but I think in every context we look at in this class, this matrix is going to be square. It's going to have as many rows as it has columns. So say we have a bunch of solutions then the superposition principle says, well, any linear combination of the solutions is a solution. We have to be careful in differential equations um, because just by convention, people don't tend to use function notation even when things are functions. So I, I think I've talked about this before. So this x1, x2 up to xn, 
These are vectors of functions. But notice that we're not using function notation. We're not writing x1 of t, x2 of t, and so on. And then, again, just taking what's come before and generalizing it. The superposition principle always works, but suppose the solutions we find have the property of being linearly independent. Well, then this solution we create is a special solution. It's the general solution. Um, when you had a single differential equation, then to create a general solution, you needed what? There was as many solutions as the order of the differential equation. Here, it's as many solutions as the size of this matrix, which is also the number of variables. So to create a general solution, if that matrix is five by five, we need five linearly independent solutions. If it's two by two, we only need two, and so on. Any questions so far? Uh, let's see. We're not quite done with this chapter, but I think, I mean, if we genuinely want to talk about the Ronskian, it's going to take more than 15 minutes because we're going to need to introduce the determinant from linear algebra. So this is a very natural break point in the section, and we will end this lecture here.